That's, that's my goal every day when I wake up in the morning. Uh, we're honored to have the, the prayer conference here. We, I don't believe it's ever been here, so we, we're uh, grateful, grateful for you to come and be a part of uh, South Texas as we know it. Um, we, uh, we're, we're very proud of this facility and, and the things that we try to do every day on behalf of wildlife and wild places. Um, I'll give you a little background about myself. I, I grew up right outside of San Antonio uh, on the Bandera Highway, a little town called Helotus. Uh, if you're familiar with Native American languages, that's Comanche for trailer park. <laughs> In those days, when I was growing up out there, everything from Luke 410 to Bandera was ranches and dairies. And if you've been there lately, it's nothing but houses and subdivisions. So it's kind of depressing for a guy like me to go back there and, uh, and see that. But uh, it is what it is. It's progress, I guess. That's what they call it. I'm not so sure sometimes. Uh, I want to pay a little tribute to a person before we uh, before I get started in my talk. Um, we lost a really good friend uh, a week ago Saturday. Larry Hagman uh, came here for 25 years to a fundraiser we have called South Texas Charity Quail Hunts. And Larry came at his own expense, uh, spent three days with us, each year for 25 years and uh, became a great friend to us and we raised uh, with his help a whole lot of money uh, for the institute but, but mostly for local health care. Uh, at least half of the money we ever raised went to the hospital here in Kingsville to provide health care. It was an event that provided funding for Halo Flight, our helicopter service, uh, the King Ranch Institute for Ranch Management. So, uh, Larry became a really, really good friend, and if you, you see him on TV, he's the same, I mean, not, not the Dallas guy, but, but he is the, the, the biggest character, the most friendly, he's warm guy you'd ever meet. And uh, one time he was here in this auditorium at our auction, and we'd get him up in front of the people and get, get everybody riled up for the auction. And I remember him saying, uh, uh, somebody asked him, how did you stay married 62 years? And he said, two bathrooms. <laughs> uh, one time, it was a charity quail hunt, and, and I was hunting with him and a couple other guys right on the King Ranch fence line over here on the western part of the Santa Catrudas Division. And, and we were riding right up the fence line and flushed a cubby of quail. And so we got out of the truck got our guns, and the dogs were on point uh, back into the ranch a little ways. And we got there uh, where we thought the birds were, and there, there was no covey. We don't know where they went. But so we turned around, and we were kind of stumbling back to the truck, and uh, one bird flew up, one quail. And it landed right on the fence line on the King Ranch side of the fence. So we said, Larry, why don't you go get that bird? You know, we'll just stay back, and you, you go have at it. So he walked over, flushed the bird, flew up, and went straight across the fence to the neighbor. And he took a shot, and he went, bam! And he missed, and he went, and stay out! He was a hilarious guy, real funny. Uh, great guy, great friend, uh, and uh, the world lost a great humanitarian when, they lost, when we lost Larry Haggard. Um, let me tell you just a little bit. I've got an hour. I can't. I, I never speak for an hour, so I hope there's some questions that Tim Fulbright or Forrest or Tony or Keith can answer. But uh, uh, I do want to tell you a little about Caesar Clayburgh, if you don't know who he, who he was. He was born in 1873, and he came to King Ranch in 1900 at the request of his uncle, Bob Clayburgh, who had married Alice King, the, the daughter of Henrietta and Captain King, who stayed with the ranch. And uh, until he died in 1946, he did a lot of things for King Ranch with the horses and cattle, but he was the Aldo Leopold of Texas. Uh, we have a sign out here on the front of our building that says he was the father of wildlife management in Texas, and I believe that. Uh, he, he had this passion for, for wild things and protecting them. He set up gang laws in 1912, 1912, people who hunted on King Ranch for the family. 
he, he convinced Bob Clayburn that there, there's 400,000 acres uh, in two divisions south of here. Nobody should hunt there for, for 15 years. We're just going to let it rest. And it became a reserve of turkeys and quail and deer and all sorts of critters. And for the, in the, after he passed away, uh, I think every deer in Texas is related to these King Ranch deer. <laughs> Because after the after the, the, the screw worm got eradicated and they started, there weren't really deer across Texas like there are today, believe it or not. So they started translocating these white-tailed deer from, from South Texas, from King Ranch, to every place they could think of in Texas. So I'm convinced every Texas whitetail has some King Ranch blood in it, uh, all across Texas. Uh, he died in 1946. He created in his will foundation called the Caesar Clayberg Foundation for Wildlife Conservation. It had, uh, he had about $10,000 to his name in 1946. What he, what he didn't really understand or know is that Mrs. King, uh, before she died, had given him some of the mineral interests of, of King Ranch. So when, when drilling really picked up in the 40s and 50s and 60s, uh, his estate, or his foundation, was a recipient of a lot of the oil and gas revenues that were coming off of King Ranch. And it, it had built up, and uh, the trustees were appointed, and in 1981, uh, with funding from the Caesar Clayburg Foundation for Wildlife Conservation, they, they established this institute uh, that now is pushing 30 years old. Are we 30? We're over 30, I guess. Okay, so 31 years. <laughs> That's right. Okay. So, so Caesar, in his legacy, I guess, is, is what we live every day, those of us that wake up every day worried about wildlife in South Texas. And we're pretty well focused in South Texas. Uh, we, we do things outside of this region uh, on occasion, but pretty much we're, we're basically focused down here. Um, in 2003, um, we just, we, we wanted to have a research park where we could do things that, that, that we couldn't do at the time. We had no, uh, no decent captive deer facility. We didn't have an aviary. We had no necropsy lab that was dedicated to, to animal necropsy, which is in animals, it's decropsy in humans, it's autopsy. But, so, so we decided in 03, we said, let's just, let's just plan a park and hope we can raise the money. I mean, that's basically how it started. So we, we hired an architect at an engineering firm. We created the layout of a park. We said, if we could if we have our wish, we'd have, we'd have a necropsy lab, we'd have a captive deer facility, we'd have an aviary, we'd have a place for Forrest and his team to work on native plants, and uh, then we'd have a conference center, never knowing that we could ever raise that kind of money to do it. Uh, Ten years later, we have a park that has a necropsy lab, a captive deer facility, an aviary, uh, what we call our South Texas Native uh, Program Farm. What do y'all call it over there? Close enough? <laughs> and, uh, and this facility. So we write, and all this is private money. It sits on state land. This is part of the university. Um, so we raised over the years probably $9 million to, to create this park. And I don't know if there are going to be tours in the back, but uh, if you want to, we can, we can do that and show it to you. Um, uh, so anyway, that's, that's all I'll say about this facility. We, we think it's special. I, I know it sounds like you do. It's a, it's a, I think it's the best place to have an event like this south of San Antonio. I don't, I don't know many. Uh, Quinta Masalan and McAllen is really nice. But beyond that, I think this is the nicest and we're very proud of it. Hope you enjoy the garden out here. That are native plant aficionados. Oh, by the way, I, I'm really proud of you people. Uh, anybody that would start a meeting at 9:30 in the morning, I mean, there's two things happening: either you were out birding all morning, or you're hungover. <laughs> so I appreciate starting a meeting at 9:30 instead of 7:30 or something. So it gave me time to actually get my presentation put together. Um, <laughs> Sarah. Um, Give her a round of applause. She does all this for us out here. She manages well over 200 events a year out here. And you can rent it if you want to do your wedding or, or 50th wedding anniversary or whatever out here. So 
put it in the plug, but she handles all our events out here. Um, we just, this week, got a brochure um, that gives you, that you're able to take a self-guided tour of the garden, of our botanical garden. So she'll have some of those copies maybe out there somewhere if you want to uh, see her. We've got about 50 copies is all, but it, it tells you every, we've got over 300 species of native plants out here within this area right around the, the building. And it, it marks where everyone is and it gives it its name and you can go find it. If, you, if you've never seen that plant and it's here, one of those 300, then, uh, then you can go find it. We also have about 150 species marked. Uh, some of the mostly woodies and half shrubs are all marked with little signs. So I uh, hope you enjoy the garden. It's been a real, uh, real fun project. Uh, it kind of came about serendipitously after we built the building and we said, why don't we just have a botanical garden? Yeah, that's a good idea. <laughs> so, so we built it around several themes in the back. Um, with that, I think I'll you know, go into my presentation. I've killed as much time as I think I can. Which button? The arrow? Okay. Um, let me read you a quote. Um, how people really kind of looked at South Texas 50 years ago. There was a book by John Houghton Allen. He lived down by Hebronville, and uh, he was an outstanding author, great writer. Uh, and he wrote a book called Southwest back in, 19, I think it was published in 52, so he probably started working on it as <coughs> uh, But here was his, uh, this was a quote from the book. This is about South Texas. Or this is hard country, brush country, mean country, heartbreak country. Ugly in summer, drought stricken, dusty, glaring, but in winter it is hideous. <laughs> In winter, the bare trees, Virginia, mesquite, and we says that the rest of the seasons have a certain grace. These are like a dead orchard. The whole nap is up. The whole country seems to have been rubbed the wrong way. The brush lies all around like dry jungle creeping. That was John Hutton's album experience in South Texas back in the late 50s. Um, and I think some of that perception today still kind of spills over uh, to people who are much my age and maybe older because uh, when you hear about South Texas, you think of the, this dry, desolate country that nobody cares about. Why would anybody live there? Uh, when I had the opportunity to come here in 1996, I was, it was like going home, like coming to heaven. I mean, it was wildlife paradise. If you know anything about South Texas, then I'm going to explain to you why it's such a special place, uh, and, and what, what we thought about it, Tim Fulbright and I wrote a, God, when was that? I forgot. Years ago, a bulletin called The Last Great Habitat. We kind of coined this whole region that. So anyway, um, the, the history of change in South Texas, when you talk about prairies, uh, predominantly that's what this country was at one time. Uh, but there's been a long-term habitat change over the last, you know, century or more. Here's a quote from J. Frank Dolby in a book called The, the Vaqueros of the Brush Country. Uh, I don't, can't read it on here. Long ago when herds were sparse, when the turf of the early mesquite grass was dense and when Indian fires periodically swept the ranges, the brush was kept in check. But since the coming of the ranchero, the brush has been winning possession of the soil for a thousand miles up and down the Rio Bravo. And the more fertile and the soil, the more rapid has been its spread. It knows how to make war according to the Napoleonic Code, i.e. to make offense. It knows, too, how to make a war of defense. During the past 50 years, terrible droughts have decimated noble idle trees, a tree that drives west of the noises, but does not reach the Rio Grande except towards its mouth. No drought has ever killed out the chaparral thicket. The drier the spring, the heavier the mesquite bean crop will be in late summer. Uh, so J. J Frank Doby, I don't know when, by Carlos of the Brush Catcher was written, but I think it was written in the 60s. Is that right? He's read it besides me. It's a great book. Uh, so anyway, that, that's sort of a, 
a real quick you know, history of how we you know, kind of came in all this brush got here when it, a lot of this country used to be prairie. So when I came here in July uh, 1st of 1996, I was, I mean, I was thrilled. My dream job was the best place I could ever hope to live if you love wildlife and wild places. Uh, so I began to, to develop, uh, you know, this affinity for this country. And as I said, Tim and I wrote a bulletin back uh, in the I don't know, 90s, late 90s, that has this term. So what, what I want to do is the first half of my presentation kind of talk to you about what we saw, what, we, what it was like 15, 16 years ago, and what's been transformed since then, and how, how it's been affected, what things are going on today uh, that would cause us to revisit South Texas in the last great habitat. Um, so as you know, it's a region of hemispheric importance because of its biodiversity. Um, it, uh, we talked point at the last great habitat, as I said, and part of the, and I'm going to go through to what Tim and I thought were some of the reasons why this is such a great habitat down here. From, I'm drawing a line from Del Rio to San Antonio to Houston and south. Okay, that's what I'm calling South Texas. Uh, if you live north of there, uh, sorry. <laughs> if you live down here, you're in good shit. Okay. One of, the, one of the traits that makes this a great habitat is there's lots of large, unfragmented pieces of property. And I'll name a few. King Ranch, Kennedy Ranch, about 400,000 acres. Uh, the East Wildlife now uh, Foundation, 210,000 acres. Um, the Santa Fe Ranch, about 100,000 now. Uh, the Comanche Ranch, about 120,000 acres. Uh, anyway, and they go down from there. So, so you got a lot of country that's not been fragmented. There's no ranchitos, there's no uh, colonias except along the, the river. So there's not much fragmentation, or at least there wasn't in, in July 1st of 1996 when I first came here. Uh, Tim has been here since 80? 81. 81. So, so he's seen it even better than I saw it, I guess, in 1996. Um, there's a lot of game species. Uh, um, that, that we still study at the Institute because it's important to landowners. Um, lots, of, lots of different critters. Let me just back up here. Uh, Bob White quail, of course, are important. Deer, turkeys, javelinas, and, and the waterfowl down here is incredible uh, along the lower Texas coast. Um, so we still, we still have, many of our projects are devoted to studying game species. Because, they're, because of the relevance to landowners and, and the importance. Uh, basically, down here, hunting equals habitat. Cattle ranching can support. If you had to buy a ranch today and try to, to pay for it with ranching, you could never pay the debt off. If you don't have some other form of income uh, to help preserve that place you love, uh, you would be in trouble. So, Hunting helps preserve the habitat because it's, uh, it's a, a recreation and a, and a resource that is sustainable and, uh, and, and, and can be used. Now, uh, so when, when people think about, well, it's, these people own it for hunting, that's all they care about. They don't care about quail, deer, and javelinas. Uh, actually, that habitat saves habitat for 500 other species that live there in addition to the ones they, they hunt. Uh, so that, that's a fact. Uh, so in our, in our view, these landowners down here are protecting and conserving the public's wildlife. As a, as a public trust doctor in the states, the state's responsible for our wildlife, but private landowners are the ones that protect the habitat. Uh, so anyway, so hunting is important. We still, we still have a lot of support from hunters with our, with our program. It's a very unique landscape. It's, as you, if you've driven around much down here, lots of different kinds of habitat. Uh, they call it hyper-diverse because there's so many species. Uh, at the Lower Grand Valley Natural Wildlife Refuge, there's about, they've recorded about 1,100 plant species and about 700 animal species. Uh, in the Everglades, uh, uh, about the same, 
but a little less. And, and the lower Rio Grande Valley Natural Wildlife is only 2,000 acres, right? So uh, when, when we were faced with uh, the Navy coming in here and moving the bombing range from Puerto Rico to South Texas, I don't know if any of you remember that, but, but they were going to close the bombing range in Puerto Rico and move it and start bombing South Texas to practice on. We said, you know what? If you want to go bomb something less diverse than South Texas, go bomb the Everglades. It makes more sense <laughs> to us, right? So, anyway. Uh, what's cool about South Texas is, I guess you could say it's cool unless you live in Zapata County. Uh, we have this tremendous variation of rainfall coming from east to west. So, uh, on, on I-37, you're going to get 25, 26 inches. If we used to get, let me, let me say that. We used to get 25 to 28 inches of rainfall. By the time you get to Zapata County, the average is about 17 inches. So that variation gradient in rainfall affects the species that live here. And, and so you have certain species that might do better in high rainfall areas and certain species that do better in the drier regions of South Texas along the river. Uh, another thing that's unique about South Texas is the soil makeup down here. Um, lots of different uh, big soil orders that occur, but when you, uh, when you get to a ranch scale, you can have all those different soils occurring on your ranch, which creates a huge diversity for native plants. So every soil type may grow <coughs> in different amounts and, and abundance. Uh, so you have this huge diversity of vegetation, which in turn supports a huge diversity of, of wildlife species. So what we know, I'm not sure that's even right anymore. I, I think that's closer to 2000 now. But, but at that time, back in 1996, we thought there were about 1,558 native plants, right? I think it's higher than that. Uh, uh, 281 species of woody plants that create perching, nesting, roof sites, food protection, numerous flowering plants for hummingbird, bees, butterflies, and then kind of the aesthetic beauty of all that uh, in one place. The, uh, another thing that makes uh, South Texas real special is the Mother Lake, the Laguna Madre, and its influence on wildlife. Um, just a picture of the coastline um, and, the, and some of the mud flats along the lower coast, but the Laguna Madre, was the, there's a lot of things that go on that I don't understand about uh, how it ameliorates uh, weather, uh, fog events, uh, humidity, all, all those kinds of things that, that affect uh, plants and animals here. Um, but it also is a funnel for all the migratory species that come through. Uh, and I'll talk about this a lot later. Uh, we have a scientist here named Bart Ballard who's been working in this area for years, and I'll, I'll cover that in a minute. But it's basically a funnel for a lot of species that migrate along the Texas coast, and you're going to be amazed in a minute when I actually give you some data about that. Um, so there are lots of migrants. 80% uh, of the 332 species cast to the coastal bend. Uh, what these species do when they come through here, they're, most of them are about worn out. There, there are very few, there are few, Transgulf migrants. Some of them hook it across the Gulf, or they cut across from, let's say, Houston to to the Yucatan or whatever. But there's a lot of species that don't, and, and they, they <laughs> they're pretty tuckered when they get down this far, and they they land in, and they have these fallouts, what they call a fallout, in these oak months down here to, to kind of rejuvenate and spend two or three days before they head on to wherever they're going. Uh, and then all the hawks that, that migrate through here. Uh, water birds, 80% uh, of all the redheads in the world, in the world, spend their winters in the Laguna Madre. 55% um, of all the piping plovers, so it's a special place. So the Laguna Madre in and of itself has a huge impact on the wildlife, the rich wildlife that we see here today. Um, this count keeps changing, but <laughs> where's Tom Langshad? Is he here? Tom's our avian. Uh, ornithologist. But at one time, I understood there were 35 species of raptors that either live here year-round or migrate through here. 
Uh, and there's no other place in the United, continental United States that has that many raptor species. And it may even be higher, it may be 40, but lots of species of raptors have come through. Caracaras live here year round. Interesting thing about caracaras is that um, when I came here in 96, you rarely saw a caracara above San Antonio, as I remember. And now they're all the way past Waco, I'm thinking now, right? Are they that far? Yeah, so some of these species are extending the northern range of their distribution, uh, naturally, or climate change, or whatever. Whatever that is, they're moving north. Uh, the pygmyow, the little bird on the top right, ferruginous cactus, the cactus ferruginous pygmyow, right now, uh, Sonia, that how you pronounce it? <laughs> Uh, a little bird about the size of a Coke can, uh, real ferocious little, little critter, occur in the oak forest uh, south of here. Uh, that's probably a red tail on the left, Harris hawk on the right, in the middle. Uh, Harris hawks are the only ones that hunt in groups that I know of, that I'm told. I don't know any of this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm told things that I believe, so, so Tom Langshot, I, I wish he was here to defend me, but I think they're the only hawk down in South Texas that hunts in groups. You know, they team up, let's go get that rabbit, you know, and they all, somehow they, they work together. And then lots of owls, um, screech owls, horned owls, great horned owls, barn owls, and so on. Uh, lots of other critters that crawl on the ground, reptiles and amphibians, snakes, gators, lizards, etc. Um, I was with Lynn Droy the other day. Lynn was the director, he was assistant director of the Welder Wildlife Refuge at one time, and then he was director for like 20 years. And we were talking about with some people, with some people that uh, had, a, had a ranch down here and had some big pastures. And uh, I said, why don't we just fin cut across, put a fence across there and carve it up so that we can manage our cattle better. And, and, and Lynn had made a very important observation. He said, you know, when I was at the welder back in the 70s, we did that. We, were, we wanted to split this pasture. And about two weeks after we put the fence up, we found 12 tortoise, Texas tortoise shells upside down along that fence. And, and he figured what happened is they, this is new to their territory, this fence. They ran into the fence, they couldn't get through or, or whatever. And the coyotes came along and flipped them over and ate them. Uh, but I, I thought it was intriguing that, uh, you know, all these years I've never had problems with fences much, but that was an example of one that, you know, you've got to rethink some of this stuff. Uh, I think there are more snakes in South Texas than anywhere else, um, species. Uh, I don't really get involved with snakes as those at the Institute know. I'm definitely afraid of them. When I was growing up outside of San Antonio, my, every time I toddled out of the house, my mother would say, watch out for snakes. And uh, so I think I grew up with a phobia. I know I grew up with a phobia. But anyway, there's lots of them down here. So if you compare South Texas with other regions of North America, um, uh, for example, the number of butterfly species is uh, off the charts, almost as high as, uh, uh, almost as many as North America in general. Um, and then if you look at just the numbers of plants and animals, uh, besides the, what, what are called sky islands in Arizona where you go from the desert, the northern desert up to you know, 12,000 feet where you have all these life zones and different species that occur there, South Texas ranked too high. Uh, so anyway, when I came here in 96, um, it was more, it was becoming more of not just a ranching culture, uh, but it had started probably, Tim, in the late 80s, maybe early 90s, uh, where people were buying property uh, for mainly recreation. They, they didn't need the income anywhere else, but they bought a ranch down here so they could take their friends and family outings, hunting, whatever they wanted to do. And there were a lot of new attitudes about management. Uh, in the 70s, 60s and 70s, it was all about capital. So that's all anybody ever cared about. Uh, so these new attitudes change, kind of changed the way people did business down here. They, some, some people came in and threw the cattle off. Said, I don't even want cattle. Done. Uh, they regretted it later, but, but at the time they thought it was a good idea. 
but they reduced stocking rates instead of uh, just peeling the country like it used to be managed in, in a lot of places. They actually conservatively stocked, so it changed, uh, changed the, the herbaceous layer of the vegetation. They put in lots of water developments, not because they were doing it now, not just for cattle, but for wildlife. So people were putting in water. Uh, they were actually managing the habitat, which, which didn't happen much before. I'd say, Tim, you got to help me on this one, but probably before 1985, that'd be fair. There wasn't really much focus on managing habitat for anything. Uh, and so they got after their, their lodges and their buildings. So there was a bunch of new attitudes that, that were starting to take shape in the early 90s and about the time I got here in 96. Of course, hunting was a big deal. It still is. Uh, cattle ranching is still here today. And as I said, uh, it's interesting, those people that, that bought a ranch south of Heavenville and said, I'm, I don't want any cattle. They got so much grass, they have, they have there's nothing. And nothing there, so now they're putting cattle back in uh, just to, to get the disturbance at the ground at the herb layer that they need. Uh, land values have increased. Uh, when I moved here in 1996, 16 years ago, I could have bought any ranch in South Texas for $400 an acre, any one of them, no matter where it was. You can't touch this country for now for less than right now, 1500 an acre. Uh, used to be, when I, at one time, before the Great Recession hit, this land was selling for 2,000, 2,500 an acre. And they're buying 5,000 acre tracks. They're not buying 50 acres. Uh, so the, the wildlife values help escalate the land values down here. Uh, so back in 96, we said, okay, Tim and I, and the, we at the Institute were upset by what we thought were some of the threats coming down. And one of them was what we call the empty land syndrome. There's nothing out there. There's no, you know, there's no houses and there's no people. So by God, we, we just can do anything we want to hope that we go the right direction. We can build a spaceport <laughs> on the Kennedy Ranch. We can bring a bombing range in. Nobody lives here. Who cares? Uh, you know, if the highways expand, so what? Uh, we can condemn all the land, you know, if we want to. Nobody cares about it. So that, that was, those were some of the threats. And I think I told you about the, the bombing range and, and what a fiasco that thing was. Uh, so these were some of the things we worried about 15 years ago. We've always worried about policy and taxes and how that affects the landscape. Uh, actually, the Endangered Species Act can be a negative incentive. Believe it or not, uh, people don't want the government telling them what to do with their land. And unfortunately, it doesn't happen on private land, but it can negatively impact endangered species. The estate taxes are the root of the problem in terms of breaking up family ranches. There's no question about that. Nobody in Congress gets that for some reason. But if you if you did away with the estate, the, the second tax you pay after you die after you've been paying taxes your whole life, then we're going to tax you again after you die, and so you've got to split the ranch up to pay the estate taxes. Uh, that's the biggest threat to, to fragmentation, I think, in the United States. Uh, so it's often sold to uh, the, the ranchette, what I call the ranchette tragedy. Uh, we're going to sell off, we're going to, we're going to, if the person dies, we've got 3,000 acres, so we can't pay the taxes, so we're going to split it up into 50 acre, 100 acre ranchettes so we can pay government. Uh, that, that's the tragedy of, of fragmentation. And, and this is uh, back in 96, and, and I, you know, your memory is older you get, but the more your memory goes and things. But I do not remember. Uh, I, there were a lot of native prairie in South Texas. Everywhere you went, every county in South Texas had native prairies. We were worried at that time and spoke up about it, about some places that had become a monoculture to exotic grasses. <coughs> at the time, these weren't real common, the, this, this, what we're doing, these monoculture stands of exotic grasses. So, so we mentioned, Tim and I think mentioned it in our, our bulletin, that, hey, you know, we're worried about it, you know, so something to, to watch out for, I guess. One of the threats we saw 15, 16 years ago. 
Uh, so anyway, uh, this, this whole notion of the last great habitat revisited, let me just go through some of the changes that we've seen in 50, 60 years. So on December, that was yesterday, wasn't it? So, yeah, okay, 2012. Um, one observation is that uh, if you have not read Forrest Smith's article, A Sea of the Wrong Grasses, uh, that's a huge mistake. If you, don't, if you read it once, you need to read it three times because it, it begins to soak in you know, kind of how we got to this point and what we're faced with. It, it is the seminal article written about exotic grasses that I know of. And I don't even know where you find it anymore. Where, where, where's it published for us? In the Native Plant Journal? Ecological Restoration. Ecological Restoration. Uh, and I read it once, and there's so much in there, I read it again, and I read it again. It's one of those things you've got to, to get to get the guts of what's going on down here with the exotic grasses. It's, it's, it's the must read. So see the wrong grasses. It's, it's, it, they've just literally taken us over in the last 15, 16 years. Never seen anything like it. When I moved here, Guinea grass, I, and I'm remembering the only place I saw Guinea grass, it was starting to take over that country south of Raymondville, kind of real deep south Texas. By about 2000, 2001, we started seeing it up here in the moths. By 2004, it had creeped out of the moths and covered a lot of it uh, naturally. And now, I don't know how far north it is, probably beyond San Antonio now, maybe Austin, I have no idea. But, but this, this creeping <laughs> threat of exotic grasses is going to bury us, I think. I so that's one thing. Uh, the, the early development, now here, you know, we always want to blame our father's generation for things. You know, the sins of our fathers. We always want to do that. That's, that's a, well, heck, you know, they were faced with a whole different world than we were faced with. There was, in the 50s, after the drought of the 50s, there was no, nothing on the soil. I mean, they, they were trying to find things that would grow that would cover the soil so they didn't have erosion. They had no forage for cattle. Cattle was the only business down here. Yeah, that's done. A few little oil and gas exploration, but but if you were if you lived on the land down here, the only thing you had to live on and to live for was to raise cattle. So so the early people that developed exotic, brought in native these exotic grasses, were doing it for a very good reason. And if you and I were living back there in those days, you'd be doing the same thing. Um, but there's a lot of unintended consequences to, that we're living with today because of that. Uh, this recent expansion is, is incredible. What we call the deadly list, the top of the list to me are the old world blue stems. And, and I mean, Forrest and Keith and Tony deal with that every day. Uh, there's something else. And I don't know what you do about it. Wish I had some answers. I mean, it's. Uh, guinea grass, you can graze guinea grass out. You can put enough cattle on there to take care of it, or at least, you know, push it back into the moths or something. So guinea grass, is, it's a very powerful grass. It's, it's crept up from Mexico. Where's it a native of? Africa. Africa, okay. So it started, they started planting in Mexico and it sort of moved north on us, but it's not as big an issue because I think you can graze it. Main love grass, uh, I'm not sure if it was introduced. Does anybody know? It was introduced into Arizona back in, in the 50s and 60s. And then it started showing up over this way. Was it ever introduced in South Texas? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, you know, it's not. Some places it's tough, some places not. Tanglehead, interesting grass. Uh, we, some people think it's a native, some people think it may be exotic. A lot of us don't know, but it's definitely an invasive. And it, it'll come in and basically cover up the country. Uh, in these red sandy loam soils, uh, Zapata, uh, Heronville, Duval County, uh, Willisee, some in Willisee, uh, Hidalgo, uh, and it's, it's uh, you know, it, I think it's manageable with cattle and fire. Uh, NRCS has done a great job uh, developing some, some research on that. Uh, then buffalo grass has been planted all over this country. Um, this is a photo of the old world blue stems. Remember I showed you a photo of the, 
the monoculture we were worried about in 1996, and that stuff. As you know, if you drove south or from anywhere, from Austin, Houston, amazing stuff. Uh, this is game grass, you know, we got Langman Love grass, uh, Tango Head. The, the, the taller grass you see to the right of those gentlemen is a, is a standard Tango Head. It can become dominant on the side. And then Buffalo, now it's uh, amazing stuff. So, uh, the probable causes for all these exotic grasses, we think, uh, I just made all this up yesterday, so I'm not sure, <laughs> I'm not sure any of it's right. But uh, there's been a change in disturbance regimes, I think, in the last, at least in the last 20 years. Uh, when we told people fire is good, man, and then it, let's just burn every year. Let's burn everything every year. Let's, we're going to suppress some brush. We can do that. Let's burn. So, we, so managers became much more aggressive at using fire. Uh, to this day, I, I, I'm not sure I know or any of us know how to apply fire on this landscape in South Texas. I'm not sure I know. Uh, we have a fire ecologist, Sandra Rideout, who she doesn't know. It's, it's a different world down in October. Uh, there's been more wildfires everywhere in Texas, but down here as well. Uh, because of these aggressive managers, there's also been more disturbance uh, from mechanical means like tractors and discs and things to create uh, brooding sites for quail or four areas. Uh, so there's been more mechanical disturbance. And there's been fewer cattle. We have, I mean, people have reduced stocking rates to take the cattle off. So the numbers of cattle today compared to the 1970s and 80s is probably half of what it was. I don't know. That's probably close. Uh, and we, we have these what we call disturbance vectors. And those are things that happen on the landscape, and all those exotic grasses just fall right behind right in there with you. And when you leave, there they are. And disturbance vectors would be pipelines, roads, paths, uh, even wind farms. I, I've never been invited to this wind farm down here on the Texas coast. But my guess is that went in four or five years ago. And I'm going to give you some information about birds. But my guess is that, uh, that if you went there today, that was coastal prairie. That's as pristine a coastal prairie as I have ever seen. There's some, some of that pristine prairie on the Kennedy Ranch, on the, on the Norris Division of King Ranch. There's still some left over at, back this way at Morellis, uh, between here and the coast. Uh, pristine coastal prairies, man. And my guess is if you went there today, there'd be old world blue stems growing in the road beds. And before long, it's going gonna, it's gonna to make a mess of that country. Uh, you know, some of the remedies <laughs> possibly. Uh, one is greater knowledge of applying fire to the landscape. Uh, we've, we've, got a, we've got a lot of work to do. And things have changed. Fuel loads have changed. There's more fuel because of these exotic grasses. There's these drought factors, which I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, but some of the remedy can manage. Can, you use cattle, but manage them correctly. Uh, a student educated landowners, uh, educate them about fire restoration. Mechanical disturbance vectors, keep them aware of those. Uh, have enough native seeds to meet the needs of the landscape, and we've been working on that for 11 years with our South Texas Native Project. Uh, and have environmentally state agency, state and even federal agencies and energy companies worry as much as we do about natives, natives using natives in restoration and not exotic grasses. Uh, observation two, that what's different, that of course you're all familiar with the Eagle Fruit, and that slice of South Texas below San Antonio that's about 200 miles long and 80 miles wide, uh, is going to have everlasting impacts on habitat. Uh, just to give you some sense of it, here's a slide. Uh, this is a slide that has a power line, a pipeline, and a road, all in one place. Uh, these are some of the, the, the pipelines that the right of ways have become bare and become vectors for exotic grasses. If you don't do anything, some people are still planting these to the exotic grasses because they're cheaper. Uh, 
so pipelines, the drilling rigs uh, that occur out there, be it they, there's all kinds of access issues. Uh, there's a pipeline that washed out in the Eagleford, another Eagleford pipeline, uh, another one coming off of Kalichi Hill. Uh, this is some of this is Keith, I think, and his bunch uh, doing some restoration with the hydro cedar on some of the pipelines. The scale of this thing is what's what's amazing, and, and it, it happened in, almost overnight. You know, we we were thinking, you know, we produce we produce enough seed to people to restore, you know, 10,000 acres a year. We'd probably be okay. Well, this thing has created the huge demand for the natives, the, the native varieties that we're producing, and actually we're giving those to the commercial guys. So uh, the scale is, the acres is, I think Forrest had a map one time of South Texas, and he he tried to estimate how many miles of pipeline, roads, pads, flow lines, frack pits would, would occur in the Eagleford. And he put all it together in one location, and it was bigger than McMullen County. Is that right? Bigger than yeah, bigger than the San Antonio urban area. So that's a huge impact. It would be changed forever. So some of the new roads that have to go in, uh, right of ways, those kind of things. Uh, observation number three, we never had wind farms. When I moved here in 1996, they were, um, I guess they were great building them in Europe and West Texas, maybe. I guess Pecos County had its share of them. I don't know. But, uh, but there is an impact on prairie prairie wetlands and prairie wildlife. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to shift gears out of the prairies for a minute and, and talk a little about uh, some of the, the, the bird migration issues that uh, these, these potentially affect. Um, it's, a, it's a phenomenal display of, of birds that, that migrate through here, um, different species and, and whatnot. We know of at least 300 species that migrate along the Texas coast. Uh, we know the hawk watch, we mentioned the redheads, uh, and Corpus is the birdiest city in the U.S. Uh, Mark did a good job here of trying to just impress on you how, did he, what, he, what the green area is, is where all these birds nest that move south, okay? So there are birds that nest all the way up into the Arctic that eventually make their way down here, and they either end up down here Maybe in the Laguna Madre in Mexico, south of Brownsville. Maybe they go all the way to who knows where. Uh, that gives you some perspective on the bird life that migrates through here. Um, we've he's been uh, looking uh, for the last five or six years. He's got the northern side and the southern side, the two places we've had radar units. They look like this. And they, they give you a, a, a radar picture of a <coughs> cone that is forgot how wide and how tall, but it goes up at least a mile. And it's about a mile or two wide, I don't know, this radar. So you have one on, on either of those coastlines. Uh-oh, okay. Uh, if you look at all the studies that have been done on bird migration and how, we call it, pass, look at the word passage rate. That's the target per kilometer per hour. So a target can be a single bird or it can be a flock of geese. The radar can't really distinguish it. If you get a flock of geese flying through the radar, it looks like it's just one big blob as a target. Or it could be two ducks, <coughs> okay? But those are the data, those are the highest rates that have been recorded in the United States. The 199, there's a ridge top in West Virginia that recorded a passage rate of 199 targets, which is either a single species, two or three birds, or a flock. It could be bats, it could be anything, per hour. Uh, these are these are what Bart has recorded. At the northern site, he started in 07, uh, in the spring, 800, 700, almost 800. In the fall, these birds are really, once they go down and spend the winter wherever they spend the winter, they're real anxious to get back to the nesting grounds. So they, they come through and, and drove. So they're 1,000, 1,700, 1,500 and not as high on the southern side. The southern side is down at the Blue Nine Escosa Wildlife Refuge. Uh, we don't know why that is. Maybe, maybe these birds in the, in the fall are, 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 I don't know. Maybe they 
they start heading across the Gulf? We don't know, but for sure, when you get south of Corpus Christi about 50 miles, those are the kind of passage rates you see. Um, there again is a, a comparison of these other places where they've looked at passage rates of birds, um, migratory birds, compared to the Texas coast. Uh, this picture was taken on the Kennedy Ranch, uh, obviously before the wind farm. That, that is where, if you look beyond those cattle, uh, the, you would see wind turbines today, about 300 of them. Uh, it looks something like that. These are all storks that the um, picture came and Bart took it off the internet just to make a point. That wouldn't take it down here, but, uh, but anyway. Uh, observation four, we've had a lot more urban suburban development. Uh, Laredo's moving this way. McAllen's moving this way. San Antonio's moving this way. Freer's not a big, it's much bigger. <laughs> Freer's not moving this way. I can say that without being criticized too much. Uh, but we know that that's, it's coming from all directions uh, in the South Texas. So that's, that's a change that's happened in the last 16 years. And then drought. Uh, this, there's a drought and disturbance interaction that we don't understand. It's hard, to, it's hard to mimic it, it's hard to measure it, but I can tell you that the San Pedro Ranch, we had an email from Joseph Fitzsimmons just the other day, and he, he was alarmed at what he saw. He went to, out of his pasture, um, I guess he's been looking at this for some time and worried about it, but we didn't hear about it until just the other day. He burned a place that was native prairie on the San Pedro Ranch in Dimmitt County. He burned it in 2006. And 06 was dry, 07 happened to be wet, 08 was dry, 9 was dry, 10 was dry, you know, 11, whatever. But, uh, anyway, he thinks this drought disturbance interaction, the site where he burned is right next across the fence from the site, a native prairie that he didn't burn, and where he burned is solid Laban love grass. So there's a drought, there's a drought effect, there's a fire effect, and there's this interaction. And we, we just don't know nothing about it. Uh, the other thing we've noticed is, if I got enough, and what am I, what am I doing all for time? I'm just up here battling. Okay? Close to the end. Huh? Close to the end. Close to the end, okay. Uh, drought at the wrong time. And let, me, let me give you this, I hope you can read this. Matthew Schnoop, worked, he's one of our graduate students who went to work for King Ranch, and he put this slide together because the family was very concerned about where the quail had gone. And so he looked at nothing but spring rainfall. May, I think it's April, May, June. Does that say it up there somewhere? I think it's April. It's March to June. Uh, March, March to June? Okay. He went back to 1905, where they had rain gauges over here, two miles from here at the, at the headquarters of King Ranch. And he looked not at those months, that's all he looked at. He said, what's, what's been the weather pattern for spring rain? Now, spring drives, spring rain drives almost every species down here. It drives quail, it drives grassland birds, it drives flowering plants, it drives just about everything. So his, his, the take home point is that since 1996, the year I moved here, and everybody's blaming it on me, but I didn't do that. <laughs> There's been no years, no consecutive years of above average spring rain. You go back to the 60s when people remember the great quail years down here. Uh, it was 68% of those years had great spring rainfall. So we're getting drought at the wrong time. That's my point here. And it's affecting our species. Uh, so I wrote this quote. And uh, I may sell it. <laughs> it's good. In towns and cities, the endless succession of sunny days is convenient, even pleasant, but out on the land it's a creeping malaise, dragging at the wild residents of South Texas, sucking their vitality away by degrees so imperceptible that the victims are hard to recognize when alive, and when they die, they are cleaned up by characters, cultures, and coyotes. This slow motion disaster has defined most of the last decade and a half. Drought offers a lesson in limits. The size of our wild coveys depends on the quantity and timing of rain, which the land turns 
and then the forbs and sets and seeds. How many quail we have depends on how much moisture we get. And in spite of our vast knowledge of natural systems and the undeniable power of technology, there's not much we can do to affect that equation except what is in front of the rain. Thank you. Kill an hour. You did, but you did a wonderful <laughs> job. <laughs> Folks, uh, let's give them another a round of applause. Not only a great talk, but uh, also a wonderful host. And uh, we do have some questions for Dr. Bryant. We have some time for questions for Dr. Bryant if you want to ask any questions. I would say, uh, more than questions, I would say if you have any observations that you might want to share with the audience about anything we've said here today. Uh, and I, I, don't, I take full credit for everything because none of my colleagues would probably want to admit that <laughs> they would agree with any of this. But I made this up yesterday, so. Uh, but yeah, I'd have to, to have Tim answer any questions or Mark. <laughs> Eric with me. Eric Drummond, yeah, that'd be great. Anyone? Yes. closer to the sun. Right? Possible. I don't think the Maybe there are more sunspots. I, I don't want to argue. I don't think the research has indicated that. I don't know. I mean, I don't know what the reasons for it. Yeah. China puts out more CO2 than any. I mean, they, they dwarf us. We could cut all our production in China. So we got to get China to help us. But 
but so it's a global thing. It's not sure, just a Sure, sure, but, but if, if we're not leaders, yeah, I agree. If we don't aren't an example, then why should China change? Yeah. Well, yep, yeah, I agree with that. Good point. Yes, sir. Uh, on the problem with the old world growth blue stamps, is there anything recently been written uh, about the problem or, or management or recommendations? Uh, and what, a, what a landowner, what approach we might take? Uh, I know the, uh, the guy, he was up at the Lady Bird Johnson Wildfire Flower Center, was doing some work on old world blue stems. Um, I don't think he's there anymore, but. Uh, huh? Steve, Steve, yeah, Steve Windhager. Is he there? No, he went to the Santa Barbara Center. Yeah, but wasn't he doing some... I think he had a question. About, what do you do about old world blue stems management? Are there any techniques to, to convert old world blue stem stands back to native, I guess? There's a lot of work being done. Yeah. So, there's hope. There is some work being done. Steve did some. We're doing some as we, as we try to work on restoration. We're faced with a site that's over blue stems and we try to convert it back to native so it's a long process. How many reports can be written? Uh, Q yeah, Forrest, Keith, Tony, Tim, y'all know, Eric. My, my impression of most 